Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to another episode of Archive 5. So if you haven't seen one of these before, basically I take five of my Archive book reviews that I never got around to posting, jam them all into one, and we get five book reviews in one. So this is the Random Fiction Edition. We have five books. I'll put the timestamps below, and they'll be in the video as well, so you know when to skip in if you want to just see one of the reviews. And uh, yeah, I apologise for the length of this. Uh, this is from when I used to do really long individual reviews. I'm now going to try and do slightly shorter reviews and do more of these Archive Fives because I read too many books apparently and can't post all the reviews. But anyway, today we have reviews of The Book of Dust by Philip Pullman. We have Problems by Jade Sharma and I read an uncorrected proof from Tramp Press. We have Enid Blyton, Five on Brexit Island, which is a political parody of Enid Blyton's books, and which is actually written by a chap called v Vincent Bruno. No, Bruno Vincent. Sorry, that way around. And we have This You Should Have Left by Daniel Kaleman, which is a sort of short suspense slash horror book. And then we have The End of the Day by Claire North, which is one of the books I was sent when I sat on the shadow panel for the Young Writer of the Year Award. So yes, so click away, enjoy these five reviews, and uh, I won't see you at the end because there's no need to do outros for these. But I will see you in another video soon. Here you go, here is Pastain. Here you go, Pastain. Talk about books now. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm here to do a quick review of La Belle Sauvage, which is book one of The Book of Dust by Philip Pullman. So I'm going to read you the blurb quickly. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Malcolm was the landlord's son, an only child. He had friends enough, but he was happiest on his own, playing with his demon Asta in their canoe, which was called La Belle Sauvage. Malcolm Polstead's life in the pub besides the Thames is safe and happy enough, if uneventful. But during a winter of unceasing rain, the forces of science, religion and politics begin to clash. And as the weather rises to a pitch of ferocity, all of Malcolm's certainties are torn asunder. Finding himself linked to a baby by the name of Lyra, Malcolm is forced to undertake the challenge of his life and to make a dangerous journey that will change him and Lyra forever. 22 years after the publication of the groundbreaking His Dark Materials, Philip Pullman returns to this epic parallel world in a masterful new novel, the long-awaited volume one of The Book of Dust. So this is the first book of kind of a new trilogy that's going to sit alongside that. Now, Northern Lights, the first book of the other trilogy, was my favourite book ever. And so I was looking forward to this, and I've got to admit, I was kind of disappointed. I think... It says it well in the blurb where it says his life was safe and happy enough, if uneventful. It was uneventful for like 300 pages. And uh, then when it did, things did start happening, it wasn't really true to the original world, if that makes sense. The thing for me about, the, about Northern Lights, and I don't want to compare it too much to Northern Lights, because obviously it's the new book of a trilogy, but the whole thing with that is that while it did have all of these cool, you know, conspiracy elements and the government and then like science and versus religion and all this stuff, at its heart it was an adventure story where, you know, they travelled the world and they went up north and like armoured bears and stuff and this for like 400 pages they were just in Oxford which is about 20 miles from me so I get that it was kind of setting the scene and stuff but like the other books set the scene as well you know i did like it had little icons though at the start of each chapter which the previous ones did as well and i always liked that there's a guy in this coram van texel which i assume was far decorum from the original trilogy but I, i'm not too sure he was one of my favorite characters in the original trilogy he's one of the egyptians and because this was set in a different time period i don't know maybe it was the same guy but he he didn't feel like the same guy, he didn't act like the same guy. What was cool with this is we learn more about the alethiometer and uh, there's a group of uh, sort of people all all investigating it and all investigating the different meanings of it. And uh, basically, they're, they're, because they're, the alethiometers are so rare, they all have their time rationed with it. So I think they'll get like an hour or a week or something with the alethiometer to try and, you know, add meaning to the meanings. So if you haven't read these books, basically the alethiometer is a truth telling device and it uses icons and so um, basically these guys it was their job to take an icon each and figure out all the meanings so the hourglass means time but it also means death etc etc there's a moment when someone's doing a crossword and their demon says what a stupid exercise words belong in context not pegged out like biological specimens which i don't know if i agree with that in fact i don't agree with that because i do like crosswords but equally i think the whole point of words is the fun that you can have with playing with them you know 
and crosswords enable that. At some point it refers to some books as well, so they're reading The Body and the Library in a Brief History of Time. So that just goes to show that there is, you know, a crossover between our world and theirs. They have some of the same, you know, noteworthy people, such as Stephen Hawking in both realities. There are bits where they talk about the Chilterns and the Chiltern Hills, and the Chiltern Hills are what I live amongst. So again, we're getting in now. 130 odd pages still nothing has really happened by this point But it was nice to see my own local area represented one thing I wondered and I've not figured out yet is who names the demon presumably the parents name the demon and the child I would have liked an answer to that. Yeah, so they get this the church gets this thing going where they kind of recruit kids and they make them all wear badges so Miss Carmichael says I'm so pleased God will be very happy to know that so many boys and girls are eager to do the right thing. To be the eyes and ears of the authority. In the streets and the fields, in the houses and the playgrounds and the classrooms of the world. A league of little Alex Alexanders watching and listening for a holy purpose. God, the whole idea just makes me shudder. Religion doesn't need more eyes and ears. <laughs> And so you get all these kids wearing badges and reporting back to the church. It's really sinister. It's interesting because in many ways it almost goes a bit 1984 with this thought police element of these people. And uh, this character goes, um, She had nothing to fear from the police or from any other agency, except that like every other citizen, she had everything to fear. They could lock her up with no warrant and keep her there with no charge. The old act of habeas corpus had been set aside with little protest from those in Parliament who were supposed to look after English liberty. And now one heard tales of secret arrests and imprisonment without trial. And there was no way of finding out whether the rumours were true. So, you know, it is building up this sense, again, of this almost this political intrigue and the, the church against the science kind of debate again. And it goes back into that. And it does add a new take on it, I suppose, but it doesn't do it while an adventure is happening. Just nothing's happening while all of this is going on. It's very, it's a very grown up version of it. He just sort of decided he was going to cram all of the adventure into the last hundred pages. And the first 400 pages would just be like, it reminds me of uh, the, the part in 1984 when, um, when the guy in that, I can't remember his name, Wilbur, is it Wilbur Smith? He's reading, uh, he's reading a book about the history of it all and it just goes for like 40, 50 pages in the middle of 1984 and the action and the plot just stops while he reads this book. And that was like this for 500 pages. There were some interesting thoughts in, on the alethiometer and this language of symbols that it has. There were some thoughts on whether that was invented or was it discovered. Nobody really knows. It's kind of being rediscovered really. About 200 pages in I realised we were gearing up for the great flood that was mentioned in Northern Lights. But then... Northern Lights kind of said what happened and then it happened differently in this, but I don't know whether it's going to continue being the Great Flood in the next book and maybe we'll see that, I don't know. You get to see characters like Lord Asriel and all these old ones and then some new ones as well. But for some reason, for me, I felt as though the old characters, they didn't really shine too much and the new characters were kind of dull. Like, I don't know, the old characters had kind of lost their edge. Some long bits of exposition here. Yeah, so I'm going to read you this paragraph, and this paragraph is kind of symbolic of what the first, again, the first three quarters of this book is. Oakley Street is a secret agency of government. We were set up with the express purpose of frustrating the work of the agencies you mentioned and several others too. We were created in 1933, just before the Swiss War, when it seemed likely that Britain would be defeated by the Magisterium's armed forces. As it turned out, we weren't, and some of the credit for our survival belongs to the Office for Special Inquiry, which later became known informally as Oakley Street. Its purpose was to defend democracy in this country, first of all, then to defend the principles of freedom of thought and expression. We were lucky in our monarchy, I have to say. King Richard was a strong supporter of our, of our activities. The director of Oakley Street is always a privy councillor, and the old king had a passionate interest in what we were doing and why. King Michael perhaps rather less so. But the present king seems to share his grandfather's interest and has been very helpful in ways that haven't been made public. So that was just one paragraph in this long conversation these people have, which is just, just, it's just exposition. It's just pages and pages of exposition. But, but then there are some really nice bits in it as well. Like this bit is nice. This is a deep and uncomfortable paradox which will not have escaped you. We can only defend democracy by being undemocratic. Every secret service knows this paradox. Some are more comfortable with it than others. And I think that's still relevant in our own world. One thing that was funny is that at one point someone acted on information from the alethiometer, which bear in mind that literally means like truth measure or whatever it means. And, uh, and one person took this reading from it and they read it wrong. And so they acted on this information that they thought was right, but was wrong. And I thought that was quite, 
interesting. Like, that would happen as you read the Alethiometer, and we didn't see that enough in the original book. There's a nun in this that has a pug demon, and you may have noticed the pillows. That pleased me. We've got a note here that says, Finally, part two, the flood. What page is this? 303. I mean, they talked about taking us to Jordan College, and they explained that there's, like, a sort of scholarly sanctity there, which is how Lyra ended up there in the first place, and it was nice to have Jordan College mentioned. What I've noted here, which... I think is one of the reasons why I didn't like this so much is that they turned my favorite character into a baby and I don't like babies like at all I'm not a baby person if you try and give me a baby to hold I'll back away and like not hold the baby <laughs> so the fact that my favorite character who was kind of rebellious and spunky dare I say and now she's a baby like I'm just like oh <laughs> there are kind of I guess trigger warnings here as well there's a guy who basically like the rumor is that he like broke his own demon's leg and that's why she only has three legs now. She's a three-legged hyena demon. And that's basically domestic abuse. A few other questions as well. What demons do in their sleep? It says here, uh, Asta was very curious about Pan. She had noticed before that he could change in Lyra's sleep, although he was asleep himself. She had a theory that when he was a butterfly, it meant that Lyra was dreaming, but Malcolm was skeptical. Of course, neither of them had the faintest idea what happened when they themselves were asleep. They knew Asta could go to sleep as one creature and wake up as another, but neither of them remembered anything about the change. I'm sure that you would talk about that, though, in the same way that, you know, you know whether you snore or not, even though you could never hear yourself snore. Somebody just tells you, you know, or it comes up, you're like, do I snore? And they're like, no, and you're like, good. Speaking of which, my girlfriend snores. They're talking about how to get the baby to go to sleep right, and someone says, drop a wine or keep her quiet. <laughs> Yes, I'm sure it will. I don't know if you should say that, though. <laughs> I think they do it as well. They do give the baby some wine. Maybe don't do that in real life. Oh, so Alice is Alice Parslow, and um, I'm pretty sure Roger. Roger was Roger Parslow, I think. I don't know. It's possible that some stuff I didn't get from this book just because I didn't make the association with the original book, but... While I am kind of comparing it to Northern Lights, at the same time it should work as a standalone, a standalone, if you know what I mean. So, and I guess it does. But I was thinking when I was reading it, if I'd read this first as a standalone, I probably would have DNF'd it after about eighty odd pages. We do have some stuff on the Great Taboo about touching people's demons, uh, and he says here, uh, "Look at Pan." Asta whispered, and he did to see the little demon, kitten-shaped, with his tiny claws unwittingly kneading the flesh of Malcolm's hand. Malcolm felt astonished, shy, privileged. The great taboo against touching another's demon was not instinctual, but learned then. There's a little conversation where someone says, surely in a flood that would be the first thing to go, because they're talking about the power. And someone says, they must have got a generator. And that to me, like, reeks of an editor comment being like, well, how have they got power? And he's like, I'm going to fix that with this little tiny line of dialogue. Oh yeah, one thing that really did quite annoy me was that it lifted this plop device from The Hobbit. So he says here, if you can explain how me and Sandra came to be looking after Ellie, then she can stay with you. How many chances, she said. I want more than one. You can have three. And then they're having these guesses and then he's like, wrong, two more chances. And then basically he, he wins this bet. He says, well, you're wrong for the third time because this is Alice, not Sandra, and I'm Malcolm, not Richard, and the baby's not Ellie, she's Lyra. You lost. That is just like saying, what have I got in my pocket, sis? It's like exactly the same plot device used. It's very weird. I guess it was meant to be a homage, but it just came off as like theft to me. But There is a great one line if someone asks, I think it's Alice that gets asked. She gets asked what she'd like her demon to be when it settles, and she just says, something poisonous. <laughs> then we get near the end, this is a spoiler now. So this is actually, here we go, I've got 515 pages in before we've reached anything that's a spoiler. So, spoiler alert, basically then they go to Fairyland for no apparent reason. They're knocking around Oxford for 400 pages, and then they go to Fairyland. So that happens. Uh, then he has to, Malcolm has to leave his demon, they have to do the thing where the demon, demon stays behind and he goes, so the demon stays with Lyra while he goes off to do something. But, kind of the point of the first few books is that that can kill you, like, and it's just, you know, I think he would have just taken the baby. Because also it would totally weaken you, like when that happened to Lyra and Will in the, the Amber Spyglass, they had to rest for days. And no, he does it, like, breaks his bond with his demon by going too far away, and then, like, rescues someone. 
It's like, no, mate, you'd be on the floor just in pain. You wouldn't even be able to do it. It's like trying to kill yourself by holding your breath. You can't, like, you just can't force yourself to do it. So, I don't know. That, for me, devalued the link between human and demon. And then my last note in this was just that Thorold, Lord Asriel's manservant, was here. And then the book ended. It just sort of, like, it ended in the middle of the story just with a kind of to-be-continued. It wasn't really a cliffhanger. It just ended with, again, with very little happening, to be honest. So, I mean, overall, it was nice to revisit this world. And there were some nice one-liners and whatnot in it. But the, the highest rating I can give this is at 3.5 out of 5. And that, I feel like I'm being a little bit generous. That's what I gave to The Woman in Cabin 10 by Ruth Ware, which I found a lot of problems with. And actually, I would have preferred to read that than this, if that makes sense. Because this, I mean, it was a long old book. And I don't know if it was worth it. I mean, I'm going to continue with this series. But part of that is because I'm trying to read every Philip Pullman book anyway. Like, I've already read his Sally Lockhart series and a bunch of his old back catalogue stuff. Count Karlstein, which I think was his first ever book. So, it would be uh, crazy for me to not continue reading this series now. But, I don't know. I, I delayed reading this because I didn't want to get my hopes up too high. And then when I finally started reading it, I realised I guess my hopes were high. Or they weren't, they weren't super high, but... I was expecting it to be at least good, if not great, and it was okay. So, yeah. So, anyway, let me know in the comments if you've read this, and if not, if you'll be picking it up. Uh, I suggest reading the Northern Lights and the His Dark Materials trilogy. It's called The Golden Compass in some countries. Even if you don't read this, I would suggest just reading that instead of this, to be honest. And then move on to this if you really want to, if you enjoy the first three. Do hit subscribe, and I will see you soon for more bookish videos. Thanks a lot. Bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to do a quick review of Problems by Jade Sharma. So I was sent a copy of this from the publishers, I guess. I don't know, I didn't actually request it, it just turned up and it sounded interesting. So this is an uncorrected proof from Tramp Press. It's an advanced reading copy, not for sale, coming in May 2018. On the back it says, Behind every crazy woman is a man sitting very quietly saying, What? I'm not doing anything. Why does there have to be a man behind every crazy woman and that's the reason why they're crazy? Like... I don't know, it just seems, I don't know, I don't like, I don't like that. However, I did decide to give it a go anyway. It's been blurbed by the New York Times, LA Times, Huffington Post, L and Kirkus, which is always a good sign. I'm going to read you the blurb and then I'm going to get through some of my thoughts on it. So, funny, observant, self-destructive Maya has problems. A sweet, handsome, heavy drinking husband she's not sure she loves. Her detached, selfish lover. Her overdue thesis and dead end job. Her dying mother. Herself, most of all, and her escalating drug habit. What's left when those are peeled away? Balancing vivid intensity with numb disdain, Problems makes a story of addiction and redemption fresh, necessary, and desperately funny. Explicit and raw, Problems is an astonishing debut novel. Now, I would say from reading it, you can kind of tell it's a debut novel, just by some of the different sort of turns of language, I guess. But, um, I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I did quite enjoy this, spoiler alert. And, well, actually, there are going to be spoilers throughout this review, so stop watching if you don't want to see spoilers. Um, I'm going to go through and read some of my thoughts. By the way, if you hear noises, my cat is having a mad half hour and is running desperately around. I think there are a lot of sort of deep insights in this. So, for example, I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs near the start. Before I'd married Peter, I wrote, I used to think I had something very important to say to the world. People write to be remembered forever, but when you're dead, how can you care? So what's the point? My mother was dying of MS. People actually did get sick out of nowhere and suffered for no reason. My mother suffered alone in rooms. My father had died of a heart attack five years ago. It was a shock. I didn't know he had a heart. I think that the character in this is meant to be unlikable. I s you alright, cat? There was a pretty cool bit about why people lie, and again, I think this character is a bit of a liar. She's kind of an untrustworthy narrator, so if that's your jam, definitely check it out. So it says, uh, In our lies, we offer the world a presentation of how we would be if we had complete control over our existence. That's why it's so embarrassing to get caught in a lie. It offers a glimpse into how you want to be seen. These are the things I am insecure about. You take things off the table, clean up your stories, edit out the parts that don't make sense and think, now that's better. Again, she is a heroin addict in this as well, so there's uh, if you're not into drug books, you're not going to like this. If you are into drug books, I mean, I found that it was a pretty bog standard drug book. Like, I didn't think it was anything mind-blowing, but it was still pretty well done. Y you know, I, I think 
a lot of people write drug books and they get it all wrong or they haven't done their research and whatnot or it just doesn't come across as authentic and it does come across as authentic here i don't know if it's own voices i get the feeling it's possibly not i always just assume when i read a book about heroin i'm like well at the very least they're an ex-heroin addict because if you were a heroin addict you wouldn't be going through the publication process like <laughs> it just wouldn't happen <laughs> it's too much hard work at one point someone gets asked what somebody else does for a living and they say he does the same thing as pete does on mad men and i used to watch mad men and i can't remember which one pete was there was a moment when the, the lady character because obviously ladies don't poo right well <laughs> so there's a character in this where the lady character goes i have to take a huge dump there was like a lot of I would call it fat shaming in this so there's an instant messaging chat and someone says uh, uh, Jesus I know he's always making quinoa and then covering it in a tub of cheese someone else he's getting fatter and fatter yeah he's probably eating a box of donuts right now covered with a box of donuts god I hate time he used to be so fucking hot and now he's like the worst bitch ever I don't, I don't think there's any need for that I, I get I guess why it's included it just made the character even more unlikable there were some interesting thoughts on success as well. So it says, you live in New York and you're so cool. You have an apartment in the East Village and you call yourself an artist. But after a while, you forgot what it was you were so excited about. There is nothing here for you. You feel like a sucker every day paying 14 bucks for a pack of smokes. You take stock of your resources and you don't have anything. You call yourself an artist, but you work 50 million hours a week just to sleep in a room where only a bed fits. You go to bars where you can't sit down or hear anyone talk. You're a hipster in New York City. There are a million of you, and it doesn't matter that you believe you're talented because no one cares and you're only getting older. The thing you didn't realise when you were 14 and thought Kurt Cobain was God was that not every weirdo with an ironic tee from Urban Outfitters makes it. There are a lot of people in their 60s, toothless, broken and poor, who have stories of almost making it. At what point do people hear loser when you say artist? As an indie writer, that hits me in the feels. It's so a quite sad thing here as well. Elizabeth had lost her father very young. He was diagnosed with lung cancer when he was 36 and she was 7. In her living room, there had been a hospital bed with a machine attached to him that gave him chemo. The cancer spread to his brain. No one told him he was dying. And the idea of him not knowing he was dying, I don't know, it's just sad. Another one of the great lines in here, and this kind of ties back to the chemo thing, and it's just, uh, the thought of a quick death didn't seem like the worst thing. Age is meaner than death. And that seems very true. It also captured kind of the awkwardness of social situations, particularly when you're with someone else's family. So, Peter's mom chopped something and Peter left again. I was just standing there in the kitchen. There was an empty chair at the dining table, so I sat down. But then it was like I was sitting there while everyone else was doing something. I stood back up. Do you need help? I asked. No one heard me, so, huh. I sat back down. I think we've all been in a situation like that. <laughs> Especially as book lovers, we tend to be more socially inept. We're more, more more comfortable around books. Another example of this awkward family situation as well. Peter's mother and father came into the kitchen. Where do you guys go? I asked, shutting the fridge. I was slurring a little and having a hard time standing. Don't lean on the fridge. Don't furrow your brows like every word they say takes all your concentration to understand. I put my face back in the fridge. Was it rude to dig around someone's fridge? They said to make myself at home, but did they mean it? Why couldn't people just say what they meant? Another bit about fatness, here it goes. So someone ordered a bunch of donuts. Stop it, you know how annoying that is. I like you just the way you are, he said, patting my fat butt. Next page, fat. I would forever be reading a book and look up to find this awful fat uniformed man in front of me. Why is everyone fat? Another cool one-liner here again. Well, it's not one line, but you know. Another cool little quote here. Watching other people's home movies was so boring. It was like listening to someone tell you their dream. Who cares if you're not in it? There's also a reference here. And then I unwittingly destroyed everything by suggesting we watch the Netflix film I'd received in the mail the day before. So they're getting DVDs from Netflix, which I guess that was before my time. I don't know. I do remember when Netflix used to be DVD only. They launched in like 1996 and uh, Blockbuster Video got the opportunity to buy them and turn them down. And then obviously they got destroyed by Netflix as a competitor, which is hilarious. But um, I've never used Netflix when it used to be DVDs in the post. And considering this is a new release, it seems almost incongruous to have that in there when, as a new release, why would you be getting the DVDs? You, you wouldn't be. 
There's also a part where the character likes bad weather and I'm the same, I like bad weather. So it says, we stood outside smoking after we ate and ordered another round of drinks. It looked like it was going to rain. I had always loved dismal weather. I found it comforting. I wrapped my arms around him. But again, every now and then there's something that did annoy me about this character's personality. I'm going to highlight a few of them here. One of them is, for example, um, we looked at a douchebag's blog and laughed at him for being a Dungeons and Dragons enthusiast and groaned at what an awful human being he was. I like Dungeons and Dragons. I'm not going to lie about that. I used to play it when I was a kid. I've actually got up there somewhere a Dungeons and Dragons starter set because me and my girlfriend are going to play it because I miss it. Sort of kind of suggests that if you play Dungeons and Dragons, you're a douchebag. You should be laughed at and you're an awful human being. Oh, another fat reference here. The nurse is a short haired bitchy cunt. How could you work in health and be on your feet all day and still be that fat? How much does this woman eat? That kind of hits particularly close to home because my mum's a nurse and she's overweight and she spends all day on her feet, you know. She goes to rehab at some point and uh, obviously they're not allowed razors in rehab so it says, all the girl's legs are so hairy. I touch the fur on my own and wonder how thick it's going to get and how nice it's going to be when I finally get to shave it. Watching the long soft hairs fall away and leading the razor up, making a path through the forest of hair. And I think that's a nice touch. I mean, there's definitely some good observations on life in here because that's realistic. That would happen if you weren't allowed a razor, you know. There's a line here. After a while, I stopped taking my antidepressants because they make it so I can't come. What's more depressing than that? On the one hand, it kind of adds to the story. On the other hand, I worry about people that might then not take their antidepressants after reading this. There's also just a thing here. Let me see. I ask him if he's vegetarian. Yes, why? You're cum. Vegetarian cum is the worst. So bitter. I'm a vegetarian, so enjoy that mental image of my semen tasting too bitter. Little things like this, it just seems like there are a lot of jibes. It's like, no, you can't be fat, you can't play Dungeons and Dragons, you can't be a vegetarian. However, it is fine if you're like a conniving little heroin addict. But again, I don't know how much of this is the character itself and how much of this is like the author going into the character. I, I've been thinking about that a lot more recently and trying to figure out how you separate the art from the artist. And in this occasion, I'm going to give Jade Sharma the benefit of the doubt. I mean, for what I assume is going to be an indie published novel, because I've not heard of Tramp Press before, and a debut novel as well. I mean, it's pretty good. The layout in this is a bit weird at times, but again, it's an arc, so maybe that'll change when it goes to publication. Overall... I was going to give this a 4, but going back through it for this review, it's annoyed me. So I'm going to give it a 3.5 out of 5. But it is okay, and if you like drug books, you probably will enjoy this. This is also probably one to check out if you're a fan of unreliable narrators as well. Or just, I guess, supporting smaller presses. Is this a smaller press? Hey Google, who is Trump Press? According to Wikipedia, Trump Press is a publishing company founded in Dublin in 2014 by Lisa Cohen and Sarah Davis Goff. It is an independent publisher that specialises in Irish fiction. Well, there we go. I didn't realise that Jade Sharma was Irish. What's interesting, actually, about this, so this was supported by funding from the Arts Council, and uh, it was originally published by Coffee House Press and has now been picked up by Tramp Press. Thanks a lot for watching. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this review and whether you'll be picking up Problems by Jade Sharma. And in the meantime, do hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon in another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here, coming at you from my mum's house in Tamworth, and today I am reviewing Five on Brexit Island by Enid Blyton, although it's actually by a bloke called Bruno Vincent. I watched somebody review one of these Enid Blyton books on Booktube the other day, and they weren't sure whether Enid Blyton was dead or not. Just to clarify, she did die in 1968. This isn't written by her, but it is presumably signed off by, you know, the Enid Blyton estate. And they're kind of positioned as Enid Blyton books, for grown-ups. So Enid Blyton is obviously a beloved children's author. This is a take on the famous five, but it ties into Brexit, which you've probably heard about. It was basically the vote held here in the UK to determine whether the UK should leave the European Union or not. We voted leave because we're stupid, and this book basically investigates that. I'm going to read the blurb before I get going. Timmy was neutral, although if he had understood the variety of sausages available on the European mainland, that would have been a factor. Join Julian, George, Dick, Anne and Timmy the dog as they leave Britain to declare independence for Kirin Island. 
but can their friendship survive the horrors of a referendum? So as you can tell, it is obviously a book for grown-ups as opposed to children. What I did really like about this actually is that it, it, it handled it in quite a decent manner, I think. Like, it wasn't biased towards the exit or the uh, remain camps. It actually, it just poked fun at both of them equally. And I read the majority of this in one go. I actually took it into the bath with me and I had to stop reading it because I was starting to turn into a prune. Otherwise, I would have just finished it in one go. I've written a few notes down, but I'm not going to keep you too long. I mean, this isn't like Shakespeare or anything, but as a, as, a, as a piece of parody, it's pretty good. One of the things I did mention when I reviewed it for my book blog is that it wouldn't make sense to read this if you're not already an Enid Blyton reader or, or also if you're not kind of familiar with Brexit because it pokes fun of, of a lot of very specific things that happened during the Brexit campaign. This didn't specifically happen during the Brexit campaign, but it is a thing that happened to Boris Johnson, who is currently our foreign secretary. I'm gonna steal some footage here and put it in. I'll try and link to the source, but this is definitely copyright infringement. Very, very well organized. What they do. <laughs> Get me a ladder. So, yeah. Boris Johnson basically thought it'd be a good idea to go along a zip wire waving little Union Jacks in his hand in front of a bunch of journalists and then he got stuck. The, the equivalent thing kind of happens here, so. So then he took two steps left and launched himself down a zip wire he had erected an hour earlier from a length of rope he'd found in the castle in order to make a dashing exit. For a few seconds, he did indeed swoop impressively over the heads of the crowd with the flag flying behind him, but he had not fixed the further end of the zip line quite low enough and so, as the rope sagged under his weight, he slowed to an embarrassing halt hanging above the journalists. Nuisance, what? He said, dangling just over their heads, the wind blowing his hair back and forth. Beneath him, professional photographers snapped and snapped away. I don't suppose anyone would give me a push, he asked. The only response he got was hundreds of click, click, clicking noises. I guess I'm hanging here for a bit, Julian admitted, reaching into his shirt. Luckily, I brought a tin of good old British corned beef to keep me company. Voice acting there. George, who had been watching with a dispassionate eye, had severed the line. So stuff like that is obviously super relatable if you're British and you kind of remember all this thing happening, but it might not work as well if you're American or Australian or something like that and you don't really know British politics. So one of the things that you get used to if you're a British citizen and you're, you're used to hearing Brexit in the news all the time, obviously Brexit itself is kind of a neologism. It's a uh, portmanteau, in fact. So it's, uh, you know, Britain and exit combined together. And throughout the campaign, a lot of similar stupid words were also created. And this always annoyed me. Whether you're talking about remain or leave, whatever side of the debate you take, the stupid words have got to stop. And, and this was parodied in this book and it was great. So, was he beginning to suffer from that horrible word which had sprung to life just a few days before, regrexit? What would he suffer from if he felt badly after the Kirin Island referendum, it? How many more bloody awful words was this ghastly mess going to throw up? Did the English language have to die along with Britain's ties to the European Union? I, s I looked up the guy who wrote this book uh, on Twitter and uh, I feel kind of bad for him because he gets a lot of bad reviews from people who pick this up thinking it's a legitimate Enid Blyton book and then don't understand it. And equally from people who think that publishing it with the Enid Blyton label is kind of somehow morally wrong. But I'm guessing these same people have never read, say, I don't know, a celebrity autobiography that wasn't actually written by them. It's a, the name is the brand. And actually, if you just ignore that and enjoy this for a like really good piece of satire, it's great. You know, getting mad at this for not actually being written by Enid Blyton would be like getting mad at, I don't know, one of the side, like getting mad at Mars Attacks for not being a true adaptation of War of the Worlds or something. It's just madness. It's also got lots of little illustrations throughout, which is good. So you get to see the characters, but equally, when I read a book, I don't like to see these really artsy, true to life photos or whatever of the characters. I like to be able to imagine them. And when they're little illustrations like this, it adds to the book without forcing you as the reader to start imagining the characters looking in this specific way. Another great quote here as well, which is very true to life. The real reason is that everyone, as far as I can see throughout this whole referendum process, has been out to make personal profit from it. 
I made my announcement from the heart as a sincere rejection of all the values and attitudes that we've seen coming out in recent weeks. That's why people paid attention to us in the first place and latched onto it as a story because they detected that here was one small thing that was sincere. So for me, or rather for all of us on Kirin, to profit financially from it would just be, it would be the final and complete betrayal of values. It just couldn't be done. So I don't want to say too much more than that because I don't want to destroy the plot, but basically Kirin Island is the base of the famous five. And what happens in this book is that the Brexit vote happens. It's revealed that Britain has voted to leave the EU. And then they head over to Kirin Island and they start arguing about it because the famous five voted for different things. Some voted stay, some voted leave. And so they do the same thing for Kirin Island. But interestingly, the person who votes leave for Kirin Island was the one who voted remain in the European Union. So they want Kirin Island to leave the UK and I guess to remain a part of the European Union. Whereas the guy who wants Kirin Island to remain a part of the UK voted leave. So it turns it on its head and that actually in itself gives a sort of certain sense of irony to the characters and the way they're acting and the things they're talking. All in all then, I mean, this isn't meant to be taken too seriously. It is kind of a light-hearted piece and it just, it is a great parody. If you read it solely as a parody and equally, I mean, it's reasonably well written. The story itself follows kind of a classical story, uh, like a story arc, like the eight point story arc and, uh, you know, with a defined beginning, middle and end. So it, it's a pretty good book. But equally, it's a pretty good piece of satire as well. And I think as well, no matter whether you are on the, the Remain side or on the Leave side, you will still laugh at this. Because it just takes the whole sort of debacle and, and amplifies it as well. And just, I don't know, it's just, it is good. I would recommend this. And this is the first of the Enid Blyton for adults books that I've read. But I now want to read the rest of them. And I probably will add them to my list. I've read some of the modern Ladybird books. And they're all right, but they're not as good and I think it's because this is more substantial as well and actually I recently read an actual Ladybird book and the modern Ladybird book was nothing like it it was like the modern one had like three sentences per page and the old one had loads of detail but this does feel very much like a children's story it's got it's, it's the right length you know there's plenty to it even with the illustrations and stuff you've got pages like these and it's about 100 odd pages so it's not bad for whatever it is 7.99 actually that's Probably don't pay full price to it, you know, go on eBay or Amazon and get it used because that's what I did. So actually, I don't know where I even got this from. But anyway, it's now time to do the official rating. So I'm going to give this a four out of five. I know I've been doing that a lot recently, but it's because I've actually read a lot of books that I've quite enjoyed. It's not quite a five out of five. I don't think there is a way that you could turn this into a five out of five. You know, I just think because it's a parody book. I didn't quite read this seriously. If I'd read this seriously and still really enjoyed it, maybe it would have been a five out of five. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Do let me know with a comment if you've read Five on Brexit Island or indeed if you've read any of the Enid Blyton for Adults books. And also let me know whether you'll be checking out the series. So the others include Five Give Up the Booze, Five Go Gluten Free, Five Go on a Strategy Away Day, and Five Go Parenting. And there's also a, se a sequel to this one, which I think is called uh, Five Escape Brexit Island, which I'll probably be picking that one up next before I go through the others, but I, I really enjoyed it. I, I, have no, I have no shame in saying that I really enjoyed it, because I did. In the meantime, please do subscribe if you'd like to see some more bookish videos. I upload pretty regularly, like once a day, pretty much. And uh, yeah. I'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Hi folks, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of You Should Have Left by Daniel Kaleman. Now, this book was given to me by Annabelle Gaskell, who is one of the Shadow Panel members on the Young Writers Award. So when we went to meet up for that, everyone brought some books along and we all swapped and that kind of stuff. And I came home with this little beauty. So fun fact, when I went to Liverpool, my friend Neil came by the house to check on the cat. And while he was here, he noticed this lying on the side and he asked if he could borrow it. And I said, no because I don't lend books, <laughs> but he has bought himself a copy. So fair play, Neil. This is translated from German by a man called Ross Benjamin. And I'm going to read you the blurb because it's only a short one. Familiar and forbidding by turns, You Should Have Left is an electrifying experiment informed by one of Europe's boldest writers. The ordinary struggles of a marriage transform in Kaleman's hands into a twisted fable that stays darkly in the mind. 
Now, as you can see, it's quite a small book. It's actually really cute because it's nice and pocket sized. The font's fine as well, so it's not like sometimes you get those small books where the fonts are absolutely tiny, it's impossible to read, but that's not the case here. It's actually aesthetically a very beautiful book and a great little addition to my collection. Unfortunately, there's a label on the back that I started absent mindedly peeling and now I'm regretting that decision. <laughs> This actually reminded me of a friend of mine. I have a friend called Matt Sears who makes short films. He's actually a professional filmmaker. I used to work alongside him at a marketing agency where he'd make films for brands. But in his spare time, he makes horror movies. And this reminds me of his horror movies, specifically that kind of creepy supernatural vibe. And also the title takes, it takes its title from a line of dialogue. So at one key moment, someone says, you should have left. And he's done that repeatedly in his films. He's got a recent one just just out called Give Her Back, where it's a possession story and the dad shouts, Give Her Back! And then there's one called I Heard It Too as well, which has got 1.9 million views. I'm going to leave the links below if I remember, because you should check out Matt's films. They're really creepy. Watch them in the daytime. Anyway, I digress. So basically, the plot here is it follows a writer who has finished his first screenplay and he's uh, his first movie and it's successful and he's off to write the sequel to it and he goes to this house where he starts to write the book and he's there with his wife and his daughter and then basically things go wrong with the wife and the wife walks out and it's just him and his daughter left in this house and he starts to realize that it's a haunted house and uh, things go progress swiftly from there now, I made some notes as I went through. Right at the start, actually before I even know, started reading this, I saw the last page by accident, <laughs> and I noticed then something that happens throughout in that the paragraphs kind of end mid-sentence. Come on, get into focus. So I don't know if you can see there, but the paragraph of that chapter literally just ends mid-sentence. This actually works really well because the way that it's written, it's written like he's sitting there writing in a journal or something like that and real life does happen to get in the way and stop you from writing just as you're getting into the swing of things. So I thought that was pretty cool. So his screenplay for this film, it did feel as though the film was real throughout but it was called Besties and I was like that's a bad name for a film. But at the same time it does seem like the title of a kind of film that I would not have seen. So it felt when he's... You know, he's discussing how the second part of the, the second screenplay is going to follow on from the first film. And it almost feels like a film that does really exist and you just haven't happened to catch it. So this section here, there are some great just paragraphs of some great writing in, in this book. And this one kind of describes why I, I don't drive and why I don't like flying. This is how it is. You have to be completely unimaginative to sit down without fear in a fuel-filled capsule. One second you're firmly ensconced in everyday life and thinking about dinner and your tax return. The next you're wedged in deformed metal while the flames devour you. And all that lies between the one state and the other is a clumsy turn of the steering wheel. Half a second of inattention. But I didn't want to be someone who can't cope with everyday life. People have simply agreed that driving a car is something harmless. The dialogue style in it, because it's written in the form of this guy writing in his notebook the dialogue doesn't use kind of punctuation and it reminds me of train spotting in that respect in the way that the punctuation is stylized so it does take a bit of getting used to i guess i mean i've read enough books now where the dialogue isn't presented traditionally but if you're not used to that you might struggle with it a little bit but to be honest again because it's an experiment in form i think it works well in the context of this book Oh yeah, it got super creepy. Something started writing in his journal as well. So he's been writing this book and at some point you start to get presented with, you know, the supernatural entity of the house writing in his journal. And as a reader, it feels as though this supernatural entity is directly addressing you, the reader. It's very creepy. Yeah, he does a great job of capturing those little thoughts that you have that kind of go through your head and then they disappear again and you forget about them. And I love it when writers do that. They, they capture perfectly the way I think about things. I seriously asked myself whether I had gone crazy. But how could you know that? How could you figure it out? Wasn't the very fact that I asked myself the question proof that I hadn't? No, I thought, it's not that simple. The fact that I'm thinking about it proves nothing. So this bit's after he was reading a children's book. Who writes this stuff, I thought. How do you keep going? How do you live with yourself when you write things like this? Why is the bear named Tump Twimbly? I asked. What's that about? And it's like a moral, and the bear, it teaches you to t care about people. But he's like, but why people? Why does he care about people? He's a bear. One minor gripe I did have, and this is the, like, I've been looking for faults to try and have something negative to say about it, to kind of balance it, because I did really enjoy this. One minor gripe is that there was this part where he was using a phone or a tablet computer, I can't remember which, as, um, like, a light, and 
it's established that the phone is charging. So here we go. Page 90. Now she has watched the movie three times. The tiger Shere Khan has fled in flames three times. Mowgli has returned three times to the man village. I pull the plug. The battery is fully charged. So that's page 90. And then we get to page 96. I pulled out my phone. Fortunately, I had fully charged the battery while Esther had been watching her movie. Right? And then, page 99. My greatest worry was the cell phone battery. We needed the light. We had to make it down before it died. But we've just established it's fully charged. Who worries about their phone battery when it's fully charged? One cool thing, though, is that it's not the house itself that's haunted. It's the place where the house is. And the, uh, this got kind of Stephen Kingy. I really like this whole paragraph that I'm going to read to you because it was it, it added to the kind of the mythos of the story. It's the place itself. It's not the house. The house is harmless. It's simply standing where nothing should stand. I suspect there are even more places like this, but the others are probably unreachable. On the sea bottom or in mountain caves in which no one has ever set foot. Or there's really only one here and the next is light years away in the infinite universe. The thought makes your head reel. Not a fictitious, but a real infinity, filled with things and creatures and galaxies and galaxy clusters and clusters of galaxy clusters and so on and so on without an end in either direction. And now and then spots where the substance gets thin. Words, they don't capture how it really is. And words can't capture how I really feel about this book, to be honest, but I'm doing my best. So, like I said, I got to the ending. The ending was pretty good, actually. There was kind of a twist to it, but it wasn't a huge twist. It, you know, it, it was... I always find it difficult to say whether something's a twist or just a plot point. The situation changes at the end of the book and it kind of wraps it up nicely. And like I said earlier, it ends the same way that the first paragraph begins and that the paragraph kind of trails off in the middle of a sentence. Because really, it's one of those books where at the ending, the story isn't quite finished. It leaves you as the reader to decide what happens next. And I thought it worked really well here. So overall then, quickly before my battery runs out because it's been blinking on low for quite a while. <laughs> Let's cut to the chase. I'm going to give this my rating and I give this a solid 4 out of 5. Great little book. Um, I would totally recommend it, especially if you're into horror. Reminds me of the turn of the screw in some parts. Like I said, it does play with form a little bit, but not to an extent that it just feels arbitrary that it's doing that. It feels like an important part of the story. And it just does have this growing sense of dread throughout, which is really cool and a lot of fun to boot. So thanks a lot for watching, don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already, leave a like, leave a comment, let me know whether you've read this and if not whether you plan to, and uh, yeah, in the meantime I will see you soon, thanks a lot for watching, bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to take a look at The End of the Day by Claire North, so full disclosure I was sent this as part of my position on the shadow panel for the Sunday Times and Peter's Phrases and Dunlop Young Writer of the Year Award in association with Warwick University. I just know that off the top of my head now, this is great. So basically the Young Writer of the Year Award, there are five books shortlisted. I sit on a shadow panel with a bunch of other bloggers. We all read the books, we meet as a team and decide upon our winner and then that gets revealed ahead of the overall winner. So this is one of those five books. I've actually already filmed this review, but I lost the footage, so we're gonna try this again. And let's get started. The first thing to mention is Claire North is actually kind of already quite established as an up and coming new writer. So she wrote the uh, first 15 lives of Harry August. She also wrote a book called Touch and uh, The Sudden Appearance of Hope as well. So in contrast to the last review that I posted, which was for uh, The Lucky Ones by Julian Pacheco, this one does have much more of a kind of a narrative plot from start to finish. And basically it follows this guy called Charlie and Charlie is the harbinger of death. So in many ways, this is kind of like magical realism in that it's set very much in our world, except death as in, you know, the, uh, the figure that comes to claim you at the end of your life is a recognized part of our existence. He actually has his office in a town called Milton Keynes here in the UK. Death is actually a woman and I think it really worked in the context of the book, but also it works overall. I think the idea of death as a woman is great. And you get to see as well the kind of modern takes on war and pestilence and famine, uh, famine so the other horsemen of the apocalypse. But our main character is a guy called Charlie. Charlie is a human and his job, he's applied for this job 
in Milton Keynes at head office and he's got a job as death's harbinger so he travels around the world and whenever someone is about to die Charlie will appear before death appears so his job is to basically travel ahead of death but what's interesting about Charlie and about death in uh, Claire North's world as well is that they don't just appear for the death of people they'll appear for the death of ideas so they'll appear for the death of the American dream for example and Charlie can even be as a harbinger he can be kind of uh, a harbinger in its traditional definition is almost an omen it's an ill omen it's like a black cat running in front of your path um, so it kind of the, the very fact of him being a harbinger means that if you spot it in time and you change sometimes there's no guarantee that death is going to come and take you you can change in time so he might appear to a smoker and basically that smoker then has a choice you can either listen to the harbinger and quit smoking or you can get lung cancer and I can say this because I smoke although I'm trying to quit this book isn't for everybody um, some of the, the the chapters as well are very kind of difficult to read in terms of they take the form of uh, they're kind of almost free form you know things that you overhear it there's no logical sentence uh, no logical structure to the paragraph I think what it's meant to represent is like flicking the channels of a television so there is no consensus on climate change no listen to me seriously this is a bunch of left-wing lobbyists and foreign activists trying to cut down on American jobs American industry this is human cause of carbon emissions but actually volcanoes last year we called technology anyway you think, human Biggie? ingenuity the power of humanity to shape its destiny in the planet a balmy island vines wine from the midlands wouldn't that be a wonderful thing desertification and as you can see this is all like taking the form of little bits of dialogue so it's quite difficult to read in that respect i personally found that it started really well and then after a while it kind of started to almost almost get a bit jading and although that's kind of a bad thing, you don't want to read a book where, you know, two thirds of the way through the book, you're just like, bring me to the end, let it finish. But I actually think it might even be a deliberate move on the part of the author because Charlie, by his very nature, is a harbinger of death. He sees a lot of different things and things that we as just, you know, Bob working in Tesco's or whatever, we don't, we don't see the extremes of humanity that Charlie sees as his job as a harbinger of death. And because of that, he starts to get jaded with the whole process himself. And basically, the reason it starts to get tiring is that it can quite often feel as though it's just Charlie goes to see somebody, they die. Charlie goes to see somebody, they die. Charlie goes to see somebody, and then it's a twist. The idea dies, and then Charlie goes to see somebody, and they die. And it does get tiring as a reader to go through that, but at the same time, a big part of the plotline is that Charlie is sick of it. And I think Claire North probably did this deliberately, I hope she did anyway, because otherwise I'm just saying her book's kind of boring. But it does, as a reader, it makes you feel that same emotion that Charlie's feeling, and you kind of have to relate to him. There is a lot of stuff in terms of Charlie's private life as well. I say private life, you know, his emotions and his uh, relationships with other people, the stuff that isn't about his job as a harbinger. That bit was quite good, and it did like it was necessary I think as a kind of backbone to the story but actually I really think what I found interesting was Claire North's approach to death and the way that it makes you ask these questions of yourself as well and questions that you wouldn't necessarily think of you know when you read a book and you read the blurb and you kind of think you've got it and then you read the book and then it turns out to be something completely different and that kind of happened with this so Looking back, I can totally understand this blurb, and it's a really short one. It just says, Charlie meets everyone, but only once. Sometimes he is sent as a courtesy, sometimes as a warning. Either way, it will be the most important meeting of your life. And I think that's simultaneously vague enough that it drew me in as a reader without knowing too much about the story. And really descriptive, looking back on it as well. It's the kind of book that I will probably never reread this and it's not for everyone. There are people I have in mind that I'll recommend it to and I've already recommended it to some people but I've also said proceed with caution. It's not an easy read. It's, um, it, I guess it takes a bit of dedication to get through it but I'm really glad that I did as well. I think it was a nice little addition to the shortlist because it is a little bit alternative. I actually said in my review, I said um, on my website, I said initially I kind of pictured it as a, almost a Tim Burton thing, you know, you've got this harbinger of death and it was almost quite cutesy and stuff. And then after going through it, I realized, no, it's more like Quentin Tarantino in that there's a lot of dark undertones, a lot of interesting themes to be explored. And ultimately I think it does, it does ask you as the reader some questions about death and mortality that 
not everyone might not be comfortable with answering. That said, a lot of the people on the shortlist uh, for the panel seem to find it kind of boring, and I do get that, I do get that. It isn't an easy read, like I said. The reason people compare it, I think, to Terry Pratchett is purely because of uh, death as a character, but actually, I don't think it has much in common with that. There is this magical realism, but there's not really a sense of comedy. It's, uh, it's actually quite a dark book. In a good way, I think. I think I'm the kind of person that would like this, but I don't think everybody would. I think that's what I'm trying to say. The only thing that I can think of that might help if you are struggling to get through it is that it does come in a bunch of different sections as well. So you, as you can see here, you kind of end and then you get to flip the page and it's not as bad. You feel as though you're making more progress than you are. And it also comes at the end with a sample, or at least mine did. It came with a sample of a new M.R. Carey novel, uh, The Boy on the Bridge. And I've read, um, what's his book called? I have read The Girl With All The Gifts by M.R. Carey and really liked it. And I've actually had to hold myself back. I don't want to read the sample of The Boy On The Bridge. I'd rather actually wait and get hold of the book. Although I don't know if that will happen. I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you want me to read The Boy On The Bridge and give you a review of that. So that's about it for the overall review, I think. And now it's time to give it a rating. So no beating around the bush here. For me, this was a four star review. It's very professional. It's very well written. Although again, at times it can get tiring. But at the same time, I get tired of reading Dante, for example. So I don't think that the fact that you get tired while reading a book is necessarily a reason to dock points from the rating. So it is a four star book, but I would say proceed with caution, especially if you're, this isn't the kind of book to read if you're um, just coming out from a uh, book slump or a reading slump or something like that, because it could send you right back down into that slump. But at the same time, if you're cruising through books and you want something a little bit different, I would say give it a go. It's quirky for sure, and I approve of quirky books. So there we have it. That was my review of The End of the Day by Claire North. I'll put links and stuff below. Let me know with a comment whether this piques your interest, whether you've read any of Claire North's other work. And if not, let me know what you're reading right now as well, so I can uh, take a look at it and potentially copy you and uh, buy the book you're reading so let me know with a comment uh, leave a rating subscribe if you want to see more stuff and i'll see you soon thanks a lot bye